Right. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Peter. I have been a Postgres contributor since 1999, and I work at Second Quadrant right now. We have a booth in the in the <coughs> a sponsor hall, so you can uh, visit us there. And if you also want to talk to me later on, and you know we vacated the room, you can probably find me there. So this this talk <coughs> is different because. Um, uh, I just checked yesterday that uh, Postgres now has uh, 880,000 lines of code. And out of those uh, are 730,000 lines or C. And, and who knows what the 150,000 other lines of code are, I don't know. Um, and so w what does all that do, right? You, you, you download Postgres, or you maybe you, you nowadays you just provision it in the cloud, and you, you, get a, you know, get a prompt, and you load some data, and you run a query, and the data comes back and in milliseconds, right? And wow, what, what, what actually happened here? And there, there's, there's two ways you can think about that. One way is like, well, it works for me, and that's cool, and I don't want to know, and then you shouldn't be here. Or the other way is, well, let, let's learn a little bit about what actually goes on inside, and, and, and that can help, perhaps, when you then have to work a little bit more with Postgres. You have to do some tuning, and you know you, you, you read some blog posts, and you, you want to understand what some of these terms mean. And, and so we're going to take a tour around how a query is being processed. So the subtitle I sort of it mentally use in my head to to describe this talk to myself is you know from query to disk and, and back again, and, and what happens in Postgres. So here, here, here's, a, here's a query. And it doesn't matter what the query is, but you've seen these things. And, and it's, a, it's a little bit small here, perhaps. But I, I ha let's change the window here. So I'm just going to use some PSQL here, pull up a query. And this is from some sample database, has customers and, and some orders, and very standard, right? And you do some. Uh, a, a sort of a, a little bit of a report here of, of the sum of the orders by by month, and you, you filter a little bit. So very simple. It doesn't matter what it is, and then it comes back within 15 milliseconds. Wow, it did all this work. So, so what, what actually happened here? Right. And, and and that's basically what I'm going to ex explain in the talk. So you, you type something in, something comes back, and you have 880,000 lines of c code at your service. And so w w what just happened here? So let's start with uh, what PSQL does. You know, you've all used PSQL uh, as the command line tool. And, and, and what P <laughs> this is kind of the code of PSQL. Right? It's actually much bigger, but this is basically what it does. Right? You, you start it up. <laughs> it, it, gives you, it gives you a prompt, and you type something in, and if and then it sends it to the back end. And PSQL doesn't know anything about SQL. It doesn't know anything about your tables. It doesn't know anything of what, you, what your query is doing. Right? All it does is it gives you a prompt, and it checks. If you, if you know, type backslash Q, it quits. And if you type backslash D, it does some interesting things. But other than that, it basically just takes your string and sends it over the, over the network. And uh, this, this was actually messing around in PSQL was actually my first uh, development project in uh, 1999. So I'm still a little bit fond of uh, PSQL. Uh, so th that's what that does. So there's no logic in here of knowing anything about anything about your database. And th this also means you could take any other tool, like, for example, PG Admin or, or any other. There's some alternative uh, command line tools also now available for PSQL that work just the same. So PSQL is linked to library libpq, which many of you have probably seen. And this is kind of a, a Mac OS tool uh, that shows how PSQL is, is linked together. So in this case, it, uh, it this basically show, it shows me all the libraries that this program is linked, linked with. And in this case, it's linked with four libraries. And this will d differ depending on the system. But basically, all that PSQL is linked to is libpq for communicating with Postgres server. And then it uses get text for internationalization, the read line library that I uh, showed, which is responsible for the command line editing. And, and then just some system library here. So, so then next, you go into libpq. libpq is the client library for Postgres. 
Again, libpq doesn't know anything about SQL, doesn't know anything about tables, doesn't know anything about any of these, uh, anything that goes on in the server. It's basically a, a, a network abstraction. So the, the API that a program like PSQL would call it, uh, are functions like this. You connect to the database, and then you execute a string, and you get something back. And what basically libpq does is it wraps that into these operating system calls. It opens a socket somewhere, Hopefully, it does a bunch of error checking, and then it writes something to the socket, and it reads something back. And, and then sort of un unpacks that information so that it, you know, the, the return value from PKX, like you can then get row information back and things like that. So, but it's, very, it's just sort of a network abstraction. It doesn't know really anything about what's going in your database or what your query is really trying to do. So the, uh, the real sort of knowledge in libpq is that it speaks the front end back end protocol so the, the protocol that the client and the server speak is a custom protocol it, 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 nowadays you might use you know build sort of on, on existing building blocks like protocol buffers or thrift and things like that there's ways nowadays you can build uh, protocols without inventing everything yourself but Postgres has been around since, you know, in one form or another since the 80s, and so back then people just made up their own protocols. So here's, here's how the protocol looks on the wire, and you can, if you get some tool out to sniff the protocol, and I'll, I'll explain in, in a second how you might do that very briefly, you would see stuff like that flying around. So the, the first column here is I'm just showing this is, this line means the client is talking to the server and then the server is talking to the client and the client is talking to the server again. So that's what that column means. And the rest here is basically that's, those are the actual bytes. So the first byte of a protocol message is always a single letter that kind of describes the message. So a queue would be a query, for example. So if the first thing that happens is that the client sends the query to the server. There's a handshake here at the beginning once you, when you establish a session does authentication and, and things like that. That's a little bit more complicated, but once you have a session established, it's pretty simple. The client says Q, then it has a length byte here so it knows when this thing ends, and then it just sends a string. That's what you see on the wire. And then the server does some thinking, and we'll <laughs> talk about that in the rest of the talk, what the thinking is. And then the server sends something back. And the first thing the server sends back is a T message that stands for tuple that describes the row that is coming back. It describes how many fields am I going to send, what are the types of the fields, what are the names of the fields, basically. And that's sort of encoded here. You know, there's more information. It's like how many fields are going to be, what are the types, and then all the names, and that's it. And then you get all the data rows, and this could be many or, or none, depending on what your query is returning. So D is for data or data row or something like that. And then you have a length byte again, and then you get the actual data. And the data is usually sent in text format. There's variants for that for, for binary format, but generally you just it's just a bunch of text of you know, whatever your table data is. And the, the libpq's lip job in the, in, in that, at that point is basically recording this tuple message so it knows what all this is that's going to follow. And then it kind of unpacks that a little bit and copies it into local memory, and then it returns it to the, the client in, in these API calls. So in this protocol, is not super hard. There's you know, alternative implementations of that. For example, the JDBC driver for Java implements the protocol itself. It doesn't use libpq. And there's some other drivers that implement the protocol themselves. So it's not very hard. So when the server is done, it, you know, it sends a bunch of rows. This could take a while. And then at the end, it sends a Z message for whatever it's, it's done. Or, and, and then it sends a little byte here that, in this case, means uh, it's the transaction status. So depending on if you're in a transaction block or not, it tells you, in this case, I'm idle right now. That's kind of optional. That's kind of the status information. So. And then you're done. So that's, that's it. A, a, cl a client sends query, then there's a, a tuple descriptor, then it's a bunch of data, and then it says, I'm done. And then the client can, depending on what the client wants to do, it, it can send another query. And then more stuff comes back. And when the client is done with the session, it sends the X. And that's uh, the terminate, and then everything gets shut down. So, and if you've, if you've 
maybe you've seen this in the log, if you forget this at the end, so if the client just closes the connection or you just you know, rip the connection out somehow, then the server gets upset and then you get these log messages like an unexpected end of client connection or something like that in the server, that usually means the client didn't shut, uh, send a proper shutdown message. It, it doesn't really like, hurt anything, it just means somehow it, you, the software is not working as it should. So this protocol is documented in the Postgres documentation sort of toward the end at the internal. So if you want to learn more about that, there's obviously a lot more protocol messages. If you go really deep into sort of using cursors and prepared statements and stuff, there's more stuff happening. But for most applications, this is really all that's happening. So again, it's, put, it's documented in the, in the Postgres documentation. You can really, if you want to learn a little bit about this, use TCP dump or, for example, Wireshark to sniff the protocol. Wireshark is actually nice because it has built-in knowledge of the Postgres protocol. So if you select amongst as many options it has there like to decode protocols, it will actually, as the bytes sort of fly by, it will actually show you something that looks pretty much like that and you can kind of see as data uh, goes uh, around. And every once in a while in you know, sort of my business of doing sort of debugging and, and support cases for customers, every once in a while I actually do that because somehow there, something is wrong in, in, in whatever the, the network or ap application setup is, and then we dig in here and see what's actually happening. So sometimes that's uh, useful. And, you know, or collecting TCP dumps and having them decode and stuff. That, that's all entirely possible. It's mostly sort of a, a text-ish protocol, so you can kind of read along. So once the... Uh, query is sent to the server, it has to be parsed. And this is straight out of compiler theory. The, uh, when I was actually started getting, getting started with the Postgres project, I was actually still in college and I was having a compiler theory, theory course. And so I was hacking on, on, Postgres, on the Postgres parser at home at night and you know, learning in, at, during the day I was having the, the course that explained how it worked. So that kind of worked out well. Uh, so this is pretty standard. Postgres uses uh, Flex and Bison. That are sort of the modern versions of Lex and Yak, which have been around forever to do lexical analysis and, and parsing. So first lexical analysis takes the string and splits it into tokens. And so in this case, it would look like this. These are sort of internal symbols that are being used. So it goes you know, through the string and splits it up. So the first one is a, is a keyword. It knows about keywords, so it kind of records that. The next one, it doesn't know, it, it just says, oh, it's probably an identifier. You know, and then there's parentheses, a string constant, because it has quotes on it, and a comma, and another identifier. It doesn't know what this refers to. This is some column name from later on here, right? But at this point, it's just an identifier. And more symbols here, and then so on and so on. So it's just basically a long list of stuff it, uh, you know, using regular expressions, basically. So it, it does goes through that. Uh, that's usually not very interesting because Flex kind of takes care of all that. So we just kind of feed it the, the regular expressions and it does the rest. And then after that, it goes to the actual parser. And we, I'm just going to sort of hand wave past this here because, again, we don't really worry about how that works. We use Bison, which has all the smarts, and we just give it the tokens. And at the end, we get out a parse tree. And the parse tree is basically a bunch of C structs that are linked together. So it, it, it kind of looks like this. This is sort of a kind of a YAML representation that I made up here. So at the top level is a list, because you could have multiple statements in one string, right? You could write select something, semicolon, select something. That, that kind of works. It's not often used, but it's possible. So you have a list of statements. And in this case, it was a select statement. And the select statement has all these attributes or properties, right? It has a target list, from clause, and the from clause has other things in it, and the where clause has things in it, so it has sort of an expression subtree. Th this is really quite standard. You just go through, the, the parser goes through things and creates these structs and hands you back a pointer to a struct, which has all this information embedded in it. So at that point, you got rid of the string, you have some internal representation, and then you can go. So to learn more about that, you, know, you can learn 
And this is really how I did it. You don't need to know anything about databases really to learn about this stuff. Because uh, Flex and Bison are standard tools. And there's standard literature about them. And they have really good documentation, actually, that uh, I, I often work with. And these two source files contain the, the lexer and the grammar. And they're very self-contained. So you can just you know, have the documentation of those tools handy and read through it. It's pretty straightforward. There's, there's no uh, magic. And it's very so self-contained. And it doesn't have anything to do, really, what, with what happens afterwards. So. At the end, you, you get a parse tree, but the parse tree doesn't necessarily make any sense yet because you have all these symbols in there, but you have to then go through with what we call parse analysis and check that the query actually makes sense. So you do some additional syntax check that Bison doesn't know how to do, or that would be too complicated to do in the, in the Bison description. The big thing is at this point, you go through and make sure all these tables actually exist as tables. And you make sure that the columns that are being referred to match with the tables. And you check the types and do the type ma types match. And if the types don't match, you try to do some little bit of casting to, to make them match. That all happens at this point. If you can't find stuff, you error out at this point. You use all, all these system catalogs to look up stuff. So you look in PG class at what the tables are and the types. And there's um, you know, constraints and, and, and things like that. You all have to look that up and make sure all, everything you wrote actually makes sense. And the, the result from that is that you basically get an, another parse tree that has been vetted, so to speak. So and that parse tree is then handed off to, to the next step. So then after that comes the rewriter. And this is all sort of nicely organized in, in, the, in the source code. So I'm sort of pointing these subdirectories out. So we had the parser, and now we have, our, have the rewriter. And the rewriter mostly comes in when you, have a, when you have views. If you know a little bit more about the history of Postgres, there's something called a rule system, which is much more general than views, which can take queries and rewrite them according to rules to do arbitrary things that nowadays we would normally do with triggers. So the rule, the, gen, the rule system in all its generality is a little bit deprecated. but we do use it for views, because views are sort of macros that get expanded into the query, right? So if, if you have a query, you have it parsed, but then you go through and you see, well, actually, some of these tables I saw here, they're actually views. So then the rewriter has to go in and sort of take the table out and put the, the sub, another subtree for the view in that place and sort of ma mangles it that way. So. It can get pretty complicated, it's sort of fairly elaborate code because of the sort of historical generality of the rule system. But basically, if you just want to think about it, at this point, the views get expanded. So our query didn't have any views, and so pretty much nothing would happen in this case. So then it gets to the interesting sort of database-specific parts. So now we have a, a parse tree in memory that describes what the query that the user typed actually means, and we have to sort of check that it makes sense. And remember, this all happens in those 10 milliseconds, right? And now we have to think about what we're actually going to do about that. So we had a you know, select with a join, and some order by, and, and, and a group by in there. And so now, uh, how are we going to do that? And this is what the, the terminology is a bit mixed up here. It's sometimes called the planner, or sometimes called the optimizer. I think most people say it's the, the query planner, because it creates a plan. And that, but the subdirectory is called the optimizer because it also does some optimization uh, if you sort of have redundancies and stuff. So it can throw some stuff out. But that's not really what it, it mainly does. The main job is to take the parse tree and then create an execution plan, which is another tree, which is completely different. And so in our query, and when I tried it, and this can be different, it would look like that. Maybe try to make that a little bit bigger here if this works. It will not work. It doesn't matter. Uh, so and this is YAML output that you can actually get from the explain command. So if you type explain and then that query or your query, you get something like that. I kind of cut out a little bit to make it fit. but So at the top level, you have a plan. And in this case, it decided, well, the first thing, or the, sort of the last thing, right? It kind of goes up this way. So the last thing I'll do is a sort. This is my sort key. And then this, the, the sort gets its input from the aggregate. And the, aggreg the aggregate has the, 
in this case, decided I'm going to do a hashed aggregate. There's different ways to do aggregation. In this case, it said, OK, I'm going to do hashed aggregate. And then the, the aggregate gets its input from the hash join, and the hash join gets its input from these two plans. One is the sequential scan of this table, and then the sequential scan of the other table. That's kind of where it hits the, it's the, the disk, right? And well, how, how does it get from one to the other? That's what the, the, the smarts of the plan are. And it's pretty big and complicated, because that's really where the, the perform, a lot of the performance is, is gained. So it, needs, it takes input from statistics that it collects from the table that are collected by vacuum or analyze more precisely. And it has cost parameters that model your hardware. So it takes that information into account. And then it looks at all the possible plans that we, how, how could we run this query? Are we going to do a hash join? Are we going to merge join? Are we going to join this first? Are we going to join that first? Are we going to aggregate first? Are we going to sort? Are we going to do a merge join so we already get sorted output and we don't have to sort? How much memory do we have for the sorting? It has to take all these things into consideration. And uh, then it says, well, this is the best plan I could come up with. Here you go. And if this goes wrong, you get a bad plan, slow query. You know, and then you go to user forums and say, my query is slow. And then people, first thing people will say, well, how about posting your explain plan? Then you post that. And then people will go through it like, well, this looks weird. You have a really big table, but you don't have much memory. And so and then you get this sort of debugging of your query performance going on. right? And, and there's more documentation about, about that out there. And this is not what this talk is about. But that's sort of one of the sort of really complex and important parts of the Postgres query processing. All right, so there's a lot of these uh, good readmes around in the, in the Postgres backend, especially. So each subdirectory usually has a readme, which is worth reading if you just want to dig into that a little bit more. And we do need people to, more people to dig into the, the planner. So if you, you know, there's work to be done. All right, so then we have a plan, then we're going to execute the plan. And if you, if you use prepared statements, then you kind of skip ahead to this point, right? You, the prepared statement would basically save this somewhere. And the next time you execute, you just kind of skip right ahead to here. And you save all the parsing, and you save all the, the, the planning, and which in our case, didn't really matter much, but the planning for really, really, really big queries can take a while relative to perhaps the execution. So execution is the executor, and it has a separate subdirectory, and I, I believe it has a readme file in there. And so the executor works sort of an, uh, analogous to the, to the, or it takes the the, the execution plan that was just produced, and then basically just works through it. So in our, it sort of works, uh, and we, we call it sort of a pool model, in, in the sense that there's sort of a, a, in a, a driving agent up here, or a piece of code that is sort of this entry point to this, and says, like, give me one tuple. Okay, and then, then we go through the plan. Okay, we're going to need one tuple here. What's the top node? Uh, top uh, plan node is the sort was in that case. So we're going to call this function. And there's basically sort of a, this big switch somewhere. Okay. Switch case. Okay, if it's a sort node, then we call this function. And the sort node calls then whatever its input is, and then it does the sorting. So first it says, well, okay, you give me some tuples, and then there's actually some sort code in here that actually does the sorting. And there's uh, there was a talk, and there's, there's always a talk at this conference about sorting, so that, that could be the sort of the sidebar if you want to learn about the actual sorting. So in this case, this, it's sort of, the, the, the model is sort of give me one tuple, but the sort can't do its sorting un, unless it has all the tuples. So in this case, it would kind of have to wait until all of this actually has to finish to the end. So it goes to the, uh, the aggregation, it calls the aggregation function, say, give me all the tuples you have. And the ag aggregation function, you know, looks at the, with the plan, the plan decide I'm going to do hash aggregation, so it does actually some hashing in there. There's hash code right, somewhere. And so then it has to do the, call the join function, in this case, the hash join function. And these are actually all actual C function in the source code in, in this subdirectory. And then the join kind of has to call two places, has to say, okay, I'm going to 
first I'm going to call, do this sequential scan, build a hash table, and then based on that, I'm going to do the other sequential scan. So, and, and there's all, that's all pretty standard database stuff, right? Hash joins, merge joins, and then how all those things work. There's you know, standard literature about that and how that works, and readme files that explain that. So, this, this is how the executor works. And then once you get a tuple up here, it's just sent pretty much straight back to the client. It's kind of formatted a little bit, so it's in this network protocol uh, format, and it's, an, it's sent back over the wire. So the, as, depending on what kind of plan you have, these tuples are getting sent straight back as soon as they're available. In this case, that wouldn't work because the sort has to finish. So there's some distinction between plans that are so sort of fast starting plans in a way that can produce intermediate results faster and, and some plans you have to wait until actually everything is computed. So that kind of makes a difference if you use limit, for example, then, then you, you want to prefer a plan that is, is fast starting. There's some discussion, is Andres here? No. We have, there's some discussion now that this model is actually kind of inefficient and slow because you you don't take advantage of sort of batching and, and sort of localities in the CPU, for example. So this model of give me one tuple, okay, here's one tuple. It goes through this entire stack, depending on the plan, right? Give me one tuple, duh, duh, duh. Oh, here's one tuple, duh, 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 duh. then you call these different functions. Very inefficient from the CPU and then the you know, cache locality and all that stuff, right? So there is some work going on right now uh, as soon as we all go home and go back to work to do this a little bit sort of more batch oriented that you send bigger chunks of uh, tuples around and that'll hopefully Im 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 improve performance on a, on a CPU utilization ma mainly. Readme file. Okay, and then, okay, then next level below is uh, what we call the access methods. And the access methods are basically how do you actually access the table or the index, perhaps. Because the, the execution plan just says, OK, do a sequential scan. And then the sequential scan, what does the sequential scan actually do? That's code that's in here. And this is also where all the index code is and B-tree code. And that is more complex than a sequential scan, right? Sequential scan is, is sort of has functions like this open a table, it's identified by OID and has a, a lock, certain lock level that it has to take. So it opens the table, it begins a scan, so it has some scan keys depending on what you want to look up, that's sort of the, the, the search conditions if you have any. And then it runs in a, in a loop until it's done, keep get next, gets your tuple, that tuple is sent up the stack and back to the client if that's all you need and uh, it runs in a loop, then you've got to end stuff and close some stuff to release some resources, that's basically it. So this is sort of the interface you have, and if you do an index scan, it's similar. You just have index open and then uh, similar like that. And then there's the actual indexing code that knows what a B tree is and stuff like that below that. So that's, when we ha that's what, we, uh, what the access methods are. So. At that point, you're kind of done. You're all the way back to the disk, all the way down to the disk, and you get your data back. So that's everything as far as that concerned. And then there are sort of side supporting pieces of code, like function and operator calls that filter results. Right? Let's see what our execution plan actually was. We have filter here by age, what we had, for example. So this would be put into the scanned key, perhaps, depending on how the plan works out. And in Postgres, the nice thing is this is all, in a way, running in user space, all these operators. So there's no built-in knowledge of what greater than or less than is. Obviously, it's built in in a sense that it's shipped with the code, but there's not really any hardwired knowledge of what all these operators mean. Everything is extensible. You can write your own data types that have the same operators and that work the same way as the built-in operators. And 
All this is implemented in C functions that look, for example, like this. So in this case, we have a, we're implementing the greater than or equal operator for the int two data type. So this is a piece of code that actually exists pretty much like that in the back end and has you know, some special macros to pass some stuff around. But basically what it does, it's get my arguments that I was passed, do some computation. This case is very simple because you kind of just use the built-in whatever the compiler, the C compiler provides. But if you write your own custom data type, you can write your own code and return anything you want in, in, within reasonable limits and then return the value. And the way the system knows how to use this is through the system catalogs. So this is the filter that the plan produced. The plan said, uh, okay, you have an in two column here. You, you have the greater than or equal operator here and some constant here. So how are we going to find out what this operator really means? So we're going to look into, first we're going to look up the types. So we go into PG type, get the OID for the in two type, uh, right? So we're going to look up the OID of the data type int2, which is 21 in this case. And then we're going to look in the PG operator table. And you can run this yourself. This is pretty much exactly how the system does it internally. You know, look for the operator name that's named this way and has the left argument of type 21 and the right argument of type 21. And that gives you a result back, uh, a, you know, a procedure name basically, and then you go into pgproc and look up that procedure name, which is in this case called int2ge. Look up the source code of that. In this case, the source code is built in C function, but this could be your extension function in PLPython or something like that. Right? You, you, it, would, it would look up what is the source code of this operator and then execute that. So this is all changeable or at least inspectable by users. So this is how the, so th this, so this was how the filters work in the sequential scan. This is how the actual scan works. Uh, very, very simplified. But there are, you know, you have your data directory, which is, I'll just have a placeholder here for, and then in the data directory, you have subdirectories. One is called base, and then you have some numbers. The first number is the, the OID of the database, and the second number is the OID of the actual table. Well, it's not the actual the OID. It's the rel file node. Those of you who know will know what that is. And based on that, the system opens that file using the normal uh, operating system uh, the system calls, and the files are organized in, by default, 8K blocks. And then if, you, if it needs to read something from a file, it pulls in one of these blocks. So the sequential scan would start at the beginning and say, OK, give me the first block. Loads it into memory. It goes through the shared buffer cache, which is many of you hopefully have heard of and have configured appropriately. And then it kind of decodes that 8K block. So it, it, it doesn't pull one tuple individually. It always pulls an entire block and then kind of decodes that block. And the block internally has a structure that has you know, checksums and, and some transaction information and, and, and things like that. And then the actual tuple data is then somewhere in there and it pulls it out. And you get a, basically a blob of memory. And that's basically then decoded a little bit, sent over the wire, and sent, sent back. That's, that's, pretty, that's pretty much um, all that is. And there's tools to inspect these files. PG file dump is one of them, for example. You can look into what's actually in these blocks. That's sometimes good for forensics or some, some debugging. So, and if this were an index scan, then it would be a little bit more complicated. It would still be a file like this. And it would still be 8K blocks, but the blocks are, they mean more complicated things. The blocks would be sort of uh, parts of a B tree, for example. Right? And so, and another important thing that's going on, actually not in this query, because this was a select, but if you have an update, so we have, in this case, we just had a loop that does, you know, he, he, he get next. If you actually write something, 
you would call at the sort of the executor would call heap update, for example, to update the tuple. First, you read the tuple, you get a little tuple handle. So, in this case here, you would do a scan, you get a tuple handle, and then with this, this you would modify this structure here. There's something called heap modify tuple, you update that somehow. And then you call heap update. And heap update writes back to disk, and the way Postgres work is you've probably heard of that. There's it doesn't actually override the old tuple. It makes a new tuple and creates links between that non-overriding storage manager. And there's hot and there's vacuum to clean all that mess up. So the heap update basically just writes a new, a new tuple somewhere else and creates a link between them. But what it also has to do is, is wall logging so that if there's a crash, it can uh, recover without having to f-sync all the files all the time. So inside heap update, and these are actual C functions. Again, inside heap update, there's a sub function that calls that says, uh, called log heap update, which produces a, a wall record. And it's a piece of bytes that describe what the update was. So it basically just assembles a bunch of bytes that describe, OK, I did this update to this tuple, and I changed these values. It's a, it's a kind of logical, very low level logical description of what the change was. And that, that wall record is then passed to this function in xlog insert, which writes it to the wall, which means first it writes it to the wall buffer, and then it gets flushed to disk, and then it gets f-sync, and all that wall stuff that's happening. So this is sort of happening every place in the Postgres uh, the source code that does a change needs to within certain optimization up to certain optimizations but basically every place that makes a change has to somehow make sure wall logging happens so all over the code there's basically just these side calls so okay at this point now I'm going to wall log and then I'm going to keep doing the rest of my stuff so this sort of works a little bit on the side and is its own uh, thing and of course, as you know, there, this all then ties into replication because these uh, descri change descriptions can then be moved to other hosts and replayed, and it replays all these changes, and you have replica. So that uh, that particular uh, the the wall code is in, in there's a readme that explains it, and the xlog.c is uh, where all the action happens. It's one of those uh, huge and endless files that forever need to be refactored, but nobody dares to do it. So that's where the wall log is. So that's basically all, all the pieces uh, of how, how this query at, at least worked, right? We, we started at PSQL, which is a very straightforward client program. libpq is the network abstraction basically there's a, a, a custom protocol that how the pieces communicate that you can uh, inspect yourself lexa parser standard tools the planner there's a lot of magic in there that takes a parse a parse tree and creates an execution plan with based on statistics and things like that and then the executor basically just goes through that plan and actually has the code that does you know, the, mer the merging, the hashing, and the sorting, and all that stuff. And so tied onto that is the, the function manager that knows about all the types and the functions and the operators and how to call these and how to call ex the ex extensions that might implement those. And then you have the heaps and the indexes that sort of ma manage the, the, the low-level blocks. And they call the wall. And then below that, which I didn't really go into is uh, the storage manager, which basically just manages the file descriptors, opens the file, gets you bytes, closes the file, makes sure you, all the files are closed and f-synced at the right time and things like that. So that's the storage manager. That's also a term that sometimes appears somewhere. So that's Postgres. That's 880,000 lines of code. So <laughs> any questions about that? Yes, please. Page cache, as in the uh, kernel page cache? 
Uh, it doesn't really do much with that. The, the way the, where the page cache really comes into is if you do this, right? If you have a if you have a lot of memory in your system, and you want to access this file to do a sequential scan or even other kinds of scans, if it's already in memory, this does not have to hit the disk. You just basically read memory. And if you do updates, you just basically write to memory and then let the kernel put it to disk later on. The wall, log, the wall logging, on the other hand, has to, the whole point of that really, originally at least, is to f-sync that straight to disk to make sure it's durable. So any write to the wall, up to some optimizations again, goes straight to disk. So it, it, I mean, it still goes through the kernel page cache because that's basically the only way to do it other than unless you use special options. But it has to go straight to disk, so you have to wait for the disk. And the wall is never really read, or at, le at least on the, on the writing system, it's never read or it's not being, so that's not an optimized case. So it doesn't usually reside in the page cache to read it from there. So you usually read it straight from disk or you read it from your remote archive which copies it to the local disk, and from there you read it. So it's usually not in the page cache. So basically the answer is it doesn't really do anything with the page cache. So, so whenever you create a transaction, I mean, uh, uh, does it only sync when the transaction is finished, or every write to the wall is finished? It syncs when the transaction is finished. That's sort of the default settings. And there are some ways to fiddle with that, which gets you performance or better reliability or worse reliability. But basically, the default mode is whenever you commit, it f-syncs the wall up to that point to disk. And there's a great talk by Bruce yesterday about, uh, it was about Postgres hardware selection, which actually goes into that point in, in much detail. Because at that point, you want to, you know, it goes, it talks about how to select your, your hardware, how to select your storage system to optimize exactly that because that's really important for performance. So there's more detail to be had there, perhaps. Uh, yes, please. Um, are, in, are indexes uh, kind of versioned in the same way that um, couples are, or tuples are? Are indexes versioned the way uh, uh, tuples are? Do you mean uh, tuples are versioned in the sense that uh, when you update it, you get a new version? Is that what you mean? Uh, it, it, roughly speaking, it works the same way, except the indexes don't have transaction information in them. So that, that's, this kind of really goes beyond what I addressed here, but just to quickly address that, uh, if, you, if, you ma if you make a, a new version of a tuple, you record what transaction it belongs to, so the, the next transaction knows which version the tuple should look at. Indexes don't have that information, so they actually have to go down and look into the heap so you basically just have two different, you have two versions of the tuple, but you don't know what they are in the index. So you have to go into the heap and look up which one is the right one. That's sort of the basic way it works. And then there's many optimizations, such as hint bits and stuff, to make that work a little bit better than the way I describe it. But that's the basic system. So is that why there's like a, some kind of a recheck transition when you look at a plan? Uh, there is different, there's different reasons for why, what those things might be. In some cases, the indexes are, are lossy, so they don't actually give you totally accurate information, in which case they, they kind of just give you, a, well, this tuple might be the one you're looking for, but you still have to check whether it's the right one, depending on the index types. So that might mean different things depending on the index. Question was over here. Yes, please. Determining what the work is is probably half the work. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's an important piece of the of the puzzle, right? Of of what makes a database system really, right? Because you can the whole point of really relation data, relational databases is you can write an an abstract description of what you want, and the system figures out how to do it. Otherwise, you could just write your own code that does sorts and lookups and stuff. So that, that's really where the value is. Uh, 
and it could always be better. It works obviously good enough for many, many people that, uh, but there's always sort of edge cases and we could make this simpler and refactor that and parallel query is new. That opens up a lot of new opportunities. Very, you know, the, the planner knows how to handle the parallel query, but uh, I'm sure we can have more knowledge of how expensive is it to spin up additional workers and uh, uh, when, you know, what, how expensive is it to move data between CPUs and, and there, you could model this endlessly. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty hard stuff. So that's why I just mentioned, you know, there's always more work to be done, but determining exactly what to do without breaking everything else is really the hard part. So yes, please. I said I, you can add more protocols. I don't think that's right. So how does GDBC work? Does it comply? GDBC, which is? JDBC. Oh, JDBC, sorry. You, you can implement one side of the protocol yourself. That's, that's what I'm saying, right? You don't have to, if you write your own driver or your own client program, you don't have to use libpq. You can, and most of the work is already done. Norm normally nobody would do that, but when somebody implements a driver, for example, what is like most recent driver that was written from scratch was perhaps for Go language, right? That was a new thing a couple of years ago. So somebody wrote a database driver. They perhaps had the choice of, am I going to link at, against libpq to do all the work or am I going to do it myself? They chose to do it themselves because then they can take advantage of their language specific optimizations and stuff like that. So. Well, I, and I, I had a talk yesterday about PG Bouncer where I also mentioned that, you know, I, I wrote my own PG Bouncer clone basically by implementing the protocol itself. So it's not very hard. All I'm saying is the protocol is no mystery and you can work with it, you can look at it, and you can kind of interact with it yourself if you, if you want to. In the back, yes? Explain, analyze, yeah, and ex uh, so the question was where does explain happen and where does explain, analyze happen? Yeah. So explain is pretty much here. This is explain output, cut down a little bit to fit here. So the exp if you run explain, it would basically, you know, it has to do the parsing and all this checking to make sure the query makes sense. Then it does the view expansion and then it does the, um, the planning, so the full planner is in action. And then at that point, it just stops and prints it out. And that's it. That's really literally how it works. So it calls the planner, it calls the, and then it has a function to print this out. If you do explain analyze, which actually executes the query and then collects information about what actually happened, then it would actually just keep going here and run this whole thing. And then these things are instrumented to know like, oh, am I actually running explain analyze? In that case, I'm gonna just collect some information and store it in the, there's another tree here, which is the execution state, which kind of mirrors the plan. And then in this execution state, I'm gonna collect all this information. And then after that, I'm not gonna send any results back. I'm just gonna kind of pr present this information that I collected in the execution state. So. That, that's, it's pretty straightforward actually if you, if you see in the code how, how that works. It just really takes these internal structures and exposes them to you. Yes? How does GDBC do auto computing? It <laughs> that, that, it, that's kind of hacked in. That was like my very first project actually. <laughs> I, I was uh, in, uh, as I mentioned, it was in 1999. I was just doing sort of an internship in a way and the company was running Postgres, which was for their production system, which was outrageous in, in 1999, right? And so it was like, well, here's our database, do something, you know, run it, fix it. And so I was typing PSQL, always hitting tab completion, and it just always did uh, the default completion, which is like file names, right? It's sort of inherited from Bash. So, it, <laughs> so I really got fed up with the tab completion in PSQL. So I sat down one weekend and just sort of figured it out and hacked it in. And so.
PSQL does, of course, have some knowledge of uh, the database, but the tab completion is really a separate thing. So if you do tap, it goes into this module and then it calls into the database and uh, looks up what the tables are and then, but it doesn't record that really, it just kind of uses that at that point for the completion. So that's a fairly sort of ugly module really, because it, of course it doesn't have a full query that it can parse, that's the whole point, right? It has sort of a partial information of what you're trying to type and then it kind of figures it out. So that's a, a separate thing that does connect to the database and collect some information from that, yeah. Going once, twice. Okay, thank you.